Good morning, everybody. It's so good to see you and welcome to church. Um, just a live stream this morning. And again, I want to say I'm sorry if there's been any confusion or any um, kind of misunderstanding. Um, we've tried our best to, uh, to make sure that we've got the message out clearly. So hopefully uh, most people at least have our apologies to those those who have still um, uh, still uh, we've not been able to communicate um, to properly regarding the fact that there's no in-person service today, but they're just a live stream. The great news is the good news is that from next week, fifth of September, we very very much hope that we won't be doing this again. We'll still be live streaming, but we very very much hope that we won't be closing in-person services uh, again. We'll always be doing church um, together uh, in person in some way. And we really want to encourage you um, to seriously think about whether it's time, uh, if you haven't done so already, to come back to in-person services. There is nothing quite like being together and it is uh, the great way and the best way to build church. So, so really want to encourage people to do that. No pressure, of course, um, but really want to encourage you to, uh, to think about that and to consider doing that um, if you feel that you're in a place where that's something you could do. Anyway, let's pray because we've got church today. And it's great to be together online. It's great to be together as church um, this way. And so let's, um, let's pray together and then worship together um, straight away afterwards. Father God, we just want to give you glory. We just want to give you praise. We just want to give you thanks, Lord. And we just want to thank you for our church. We want to thank you for one another. We want to thank you for the opportunity of meeting together. Lord, we, we think back to these 18 months, Lord, and we're grateful to you for the way that as a church we've been able to still connect together in different ways. And we pray, Father God, as we move forward from this point, that you will help us, that you will guide us, and that you will lead us. But Father God, what we, um, what we pray most of all for this moment is that, Lord, as we seek to have a service together right now, Father God, to worship you, to honour you, to hear your word, to do all of the other things that we're going to do, that most of all you would be exalted, you would be glorified, and you would bring us to the place that you, where you want us to be uh, as individuals and as a church. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's worship together with the first of our um, songs.
Amen. God is a generous giver. What a beautiful and amazing truth that is for us to celebrate and to remember today. Amen. We've been, uh, you'll be aware that there hasn't been a, uh, a prayer diary coming out. We have had a prayers news sheet, but Wendy hasn't been sending out a prayer diary. Instead, We've been uh, wanting as a church over the month of August to be focusing in on praying for our children. And uh, I trust that you have been doing that. And of course, I trust that you won't stop now, but you'll continue to pray for our children into the, um, into the months ahead. And that will be a fantastic time. Uh, the prayer diary, of course, should be coming back um, very soon. But right now we're going to come and we're going to pray together as well. Um, very much in line with what we've been praying, but particularly as um, this week, or, or it might actually for some schools be the following week, but um, uh, this week the children go back to school. And uh, we are, uh, certainly some of the All Sages schools are going back this week, some of them not until next week. We want to pray together that. Um, God will be with them, um, our own church, church children and our own individual children, but also um, for, the, uh, for local children and children in our nation, um, as schools and our teachers, um, as they return to school. And uh, to do that, I want to first of all play a prayer on a video. Um, it's from America, so of course it looks very different to um, what our schools you look to, no school uniform or anything like that. But the heart of that prayer, um, very much, I'm sure, what our heart for our own children and our own schools um, would be as well. And then we will pray together um, afterwards ourselves. Mm -hmm. 
Amen. Let's pray together. Father, we want to worship you. We want to honour you and we want to glorify you that we are living in a country where our children can receive an education. Father, and we just want to pray for our children as they go back to school. We know that schools are great places, but they're also not perfect places, and they're also places full of challenges. And so we pray, Lord God, that they would, as our children go back to school, indeed, as the school staff go back to school as well, that, Father God, your hand would be upon them. We pray for our children in the church, that as they go back to school, you would guide them, protect them, help them and use them. We pray for those in our church who are teachers that, uh, and school staff, that Father, in Jesus' name, you would do the same thing. Help them to serve well where they are, in Jesus' name. Encourage them, help them and strengthen them, Lord God, in all that they do. Father God, we pray for our, the schools and the ch- our children across our nation. Lord, in this local area and then across our nation. And we pray in Jesus' name that, Father God, your kingdom will come, your will will be done. You would bless them, you would help them, you would be with them. You would give them peace. And, Lord, just help them to excel, to succeed and to be well in Jesus' name. Father, may this coming year, after all of the challenges of the last one, Uh, or the last year and a half. Father uh, God, be be an absolute triumph, Lord, and everything we would want it to be. Father God, as there may still be some restrictions, as there may may still be some challenges, and no doubt there will be others, Lord, will you be gracious, and will you place your hand upon our children and upon our schools? In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Let's move towards communion together, shall we? And uh, let's worship together. May my life declare the honour of your name. Reveal the heart of Christ. Light the darkest place with sacrificial love. Cause me, Lord, to reach out in the Father's name, to glorify the Lamb once slain. To light the darkest place with sacrificial love.
the honor of your name Reveal the heart of Christ who came To light the darkest place with sacrificial love Cause me, Lord, to reach out in the Father's name To glorify the Lamb Light the darkest place with sacrificial love. Teach me, Lord, to make my life as an offering to tell the world that Jesus Christ is King for the glory. Amen. Let's join with in communion together. Trust that you're prepared. Um, give you a few moments to do that. Um, if you're not, just grab some bread or if you don't have any bread, grab a biscuit, grab a cracker, grab anything really that will be, um, that will uh, help you to, to kind of take part. And also, um, uh, if you've got any, uh, any juice or wine, if that's what you're using, um, uh, we tend to use tends to just use juice because it is sim, symbolic, and um, encourage you to even just use water if that's all you've got. But join with us, and to make it really meaningful, um, let's um, let's make sure that we are approaching this time of communion in the right spirit and the right heart. Um, it's 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 a great thing when we come into the presence of God. And when we remember what he's done for us upon the cross, how he died for us, how he gave his life for us, he gave his all for us so that we could be forgiven of the things that we've done wrong. So we could be forgiven of our sin and we could be made right with God. And what this, what this symbolizes is the fact that Jesus did that for us. Jesus died, his body was broken, his blood then spilled out uh, as he died upon the cross and that sacrifice that he made, that broken body and that shed blood um, is our ticket, if you like, back into right relationship and right standing with God. We can be forgiven, we can know his grace and his love in our lives and we can serve him with clear consciences because we've been forgiven and we can know that we will be with him for eternity in heaven and that's the hope that's the assurance that as Christians we have um, when we give our lives to Christ when we part, offer him and, 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 and surrender our lives to him then we know that we receive that grace that kindness that forgiveness from him and uh, any of you that are watching um, this live stream today, you've never ever made a decision to follow Jesus. You've never actually come and prayed a prayer along the line, lines of, Lord, I'm sorry for my wrongdoing. I give my life to you to follow you. Forgive me of my sins. Wash me clean. Make me clean. Make me new and help me to live for you. If you've never prayed that prayer, if you're watching today and you've never ever prayed that prayer, a prayer like that, then I want to encourage you to do so as God is speaking to you at this moment. Um, and before we actually share the bread and the wine, the juice, um, to remember what Jesus has done for us, please pray that prayer, a prayer like that now. Ask Jesus to come into your life. Mean it. Even if the words don't seem to come out right, just Give your life to God. Give your life over to him. It's the greatest thing that you could ever do. It's the best thing and the most important thing that you could ever do. It's better than, more important than any other decision that you will ever make in your life because it will affect your whole 
forever, your whole eternity. And we really want you to be a part of God's family. We really want you to know his peace and his forgiveness and his life in your life. So please, right now, pray. Lord Jesus, come into my life. Forgive me of my sin, my wrongdoing, and help me to live for you. Help me to begin my life again, following you and as a Christian and brand new person. Amen. Those who've prayed that prayer, and I trust there are people that have prayed that prayer, then don't just leave it there. If you've watched these live streams before, you'll know that we encourage you to do this, to get in contact with us. And the very best way to do that is by that telephone number that you see there on the screen. Uh, the email is also there. But um, actually, the, the, the annoying thing is that, of course, we, we've, we had some issues with our email and we're advertising the wrong email after it had actually stopped working for a long period of time, but that's the good email. And uh, now that we're coming back to normal, um, that email is now regularly checked, so that's an option too. But the best way to get in touch with us is just to send a message to that phone and say, I made the decision to become a Christian today. And uh, we would like to then go get in contact with you and, uh, and help you as you begin this journey of following Jesus. And actually, hey, we, we help one another. so. You can be an encouragement and a help to us as well. And right now, let's begin that by sharing communion together. The Bible says that the Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he broke it, he said, take, eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. Do this as often as you eat it in remembrance of me. And in the same way afterwards, he took the cup. And when he had blessed it, which meant when he prayed over it, when he'd kind of drawn proper attention to it and what God was going to do, he, he said, take, drink. This is my blood, which is broken, which is spilled for you. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat the bread and you drink the cup, as, he, as, it, as it's sometimes put, you declare and proclaim and announce that Jesus died until he returns. Let's share this together. Wonderful. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your goodness. We thank you for your great love. Though we were far away from you, Jesus, you paid the price to bring us near. We know that God couldn't just forget things. Our actions are far too important for that. But he made a way for us to come to you and to know forgiveness for our mistakes and our wrongdoing. Thank you that we no longer have to live with guilt, with fear, with any of those negative things, because by trusting in you, we become children of God and we become forgiven and free. Praise you for that, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. As we move towards our preaching time, um, Here's a, a video to, uh, to help us um, begin to think through the themes of what's going to be shared.
Amen. It's uh, absolutely great that the preacher today is Alan, Alan Roper. And uh, he's prepared a message and uh, you're going to see that what he's wanting to bring today um, ha- really kind of is linked in with that, with, with that video and says so much more. So we want to pray as Alan comes and preaches to us now and shares this word. Pray that God will open our hearts and uh, just hear what he wants us uh, to hear today. Father God, we just thank you. Uh, for your word. And we thank you, Lord God, when uh, people step up and seek to, uh, to push into new areas of service and ministry for you, Father God. And we just pray as Alan brings this word right now that you'll bless him. And we pray, Father God, that you will use him to speak into our hearts and tell us everything you want us to hear. Father, may we be changed. May we be renewed challenged and uh, and made bigger by what we hear. In Jesus' name, amen. Here's God's word. Thanks, Alan. Good morning. I know what you're all thinking. Where's the thing on the other side of his hoodie? It's stuck in there and I can't be bothered to get it out. Every time I wash it, it does this and I've lost patience with it. Anyway. At the start of 2020, I found myself in a very weird position. The Christmas period had ended, and with that it saw a reduction in the number of hours I was working down the hotel. That made things a bit tricky. See, I'd recently moved into a new flat on my own, and money was a bit of a concern. And because money was a concern as well, I'd worked a lot over the festive period, out of necessity, and I became accustomed to the busy times and constant interpersonal contact it afforded me. Now being back in my flat alone, miserable January weather, a mild malaise was starting to set in. A little while beforehand, I'd actually downloaded an app onto my phone that every morning at 6am, though you can change what time you want it to do this app, it prompts me with a randomly selected passage from the Bible. One particular morning, it presented me with Hebrews 12.11, and that's particularly stuck with me ever since, especially considering all the other massive changes that 2020 brought after this. For those of you unfamiliar, though, Hebrews chapter 12, verses 4-11 to read as follows. In your struggle against sin, you have not yet resisted to the point of shedding your blood. And you have forgotten that word of encouragement addresses you as sons. My son, do not make light of the Lord's discipline, and do not lose heart when he rebukes you, because the Lord disciplines those he loves, and he punishes everyone he accepts as a son. Endure hardship as a discipline. God is treating you as sons, for what son is not disciplined by his father? If you are not disciplined, and everyone undergoes discipline, then you are illegitimate children and not true sons. Moreover, we have all had human fathers who disciplined us and we respected them for it. How much more should we submit to the Father of our spirits and live? Our fathers disciplined us for a little while, they thought best, but God disciplines us for our good, that we may share in his holiness. And then, verse 11, No discipline seems pleasant at the time, but painful. Later on, however, it produces a harvest of righteousness and peace for those who have been trained by it. The concept of discipline, then, stood out to me for some reason. You know, in particular, that morning. I suppose you could say it was because I was exhibiting discipline by getting up at 6 o'clock in the morning and reading that every day. Maybe. But ever since, I've really pondered the meaning of discipline, the very meaning of the word, from time to time. And what does it mean to me, and what should it mean to me? I very vaguely remember the first time I ever came across it as a word. I was a small child playing computer games with my brother. We were actually playing the old Championship Manager 1992 season, I think it was that we were playing this in like 1995 or something. One thing the game listed for each player, though, was their discipline. Under the heading, it counted the number of yellow cards and red cards they accrued during the season, and any bans that were applied to them. So if you got a red card, you might be banned for the next game. From then on, I kind of regarded the discipline as basically just being being naughty. It's a rather simplistic view, but I was about five at the time, so I'll use that in my defence. However, if I go online and I search in a search engine the word discipline and then definition, I'll get a dictionary result and it'll say a few different things. It'll give me a few different definitions and break those down into whether it's applying it as a noun or a verb. In the Bible, we also actually see two different words used for discipline sometimes. Proverbs 3.11, which is actually quoted in Hebrews chapter 12, is a good example of this. My son, do not despise the Lord's discipline or be wary of his rebuke. So in Hebrew, 
These words were yasa and yakach, or yakak. I'm not quite sure on the pronunciation. Yasa was translated directly into the word discipline, and that refers to God's actions, while yakach was translated to rebuke, referring to God's words. So we can see there are slight differences in the word, and that young me was a little off the mark with his thinking. I was about five, so. Again, though, if we use the definitions, let's think about Hebrews 12, 11 again. No discipline seems pleasant at the time, but painful. Later on, however, it produces a harvest of righteousness and peace for those who have been trained by it. So the verse admits that discipline is unpleasant, at least in the short term. Being told off or otherwise punished, maybe being detained or something, is never fun and something we strive to avoid. But is that all it could refer to here? Is discipline only in reference to punishment? Why would we ever consider that a good thing? So I've got a story my dad used to tell me when I was little. I think he actually wrote it out into a book that was quite long. I've tried to trim it down a little bit. So there was a man. He was rich to an extent beyond imagination and anything he ever wanted, he just bought. Big house, try 12. Buckingham Palace is just being rented out to the Queen. Private jet? Concord was withdrawn from public service just for him to use as his own thing, along with the space shuttles. Anything he could think of was his, but with all this, he was bored. There was nothing left to struggle for. What was there to do? He placed an advert in the newspapers, all of them, asking for suggestions. It wasn't cheap to do this, but what's a few billion pounds to him? If anyone could find something new for him, they'd be financially set for life. After weeks and weeks of listening to suggestions from thousands and thousands of people, he was losing hope he would ever find a new goal in life, until one man came before him. This man claimed to have spotted a rare and wonderful creature on his travels in the Asian forests, a great powerful being, the white hairy ape. Finally, he had something to strive for. The guest was rewarded handsomely for the information and offered far more riches to secure the beast for him. An expedition began and around two months later, a shockingly depleted hunting party returned. The men were tired, battered, bruised, but accompanied by a huge crate and an old man from the forests. Sir, I beg of you, release the beast back to where it came. But the pleas fell on deaf ears, and subsequent attempts were actually drowned out by the roars and shaking of the crate the beast was kept in. This was it. This was what he had wanted. There is no way I am letting this go. This beast has given me new purpose. The ape was transferred from the great crate into a great cage within one of the man's mansions. Seeing the creature, the staff were all terrified and they resigned on the spot, but the man didn't care. All he needed was the ape and the cage it was in. Old man, you should leave too. I never asked you to be here. Fine, sir, but let me offer you some advice before I go. Never, ever, under any circumstances, poke the ape in the ribs. At least listen to me on this. Well, now that everyone had left, the man found himself alone. He sat avidly watching the ape for days on end. He ate meals watching it prowl the cage, slept in the sleeping bag by the bars, but over the next few weeks he became bored and reflected on the warning the old man had given him. Why shouldn't he poke the ape in the ribs? After a few more days of boredom growing, he caved in. The ape was just standing by the bars, not doing anything of note. It had begun to do this quite often. But the man timidly inched forwards, stretched out his arm, and poked it in the ribs with a trembling finger. The ape responded with a deafening roar, and effortlessly tore the bars from the cage. The man turned and fled, and the ape in hot pursuit. Pleas for help echoed around the empty mansion, everyone having left upon the arrival of the ape. All he could do was run, to try to get away from the beast, or to get to help many miles away. The man tore from the room, skidded around the door into a hallway, and took off for the front door, not daring look over his shoulder. As he got outside, he ran for his car, leapt into the passenger seat. WAIT! His driver had left too? He bounced back out and ran for the gardens, realising that delay had allowed the ape to get ever closer to him. All he could do was run, yet in his panic he wasn't aware of his surroundings and tripped over a hose abandoned by one of the gardeners as he crashed onto the ground. The fall left him winded, and through the pain in his legs and the fear he felt, all he could do was roll onto his back and face the monster he had unwittingly unleashed. The ape drew close and loomed over him. Ten feet tall, pure rage and white fur. It drew back its great arm. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, please don't kill me, please! But the arm came flying forwards and stopped, just short of the man's chest. A single finger protruded and from the fist of the ape and poked him lightly in the chest. In a great booming voice, the giant creature declared, 
Take. You're it. So where does this story fit in, then? What can we learn about discipline from it? See, it's clear that the man failed to obey the rule set before him from the old man. And to some extent, he suffered for it. The workers he sought for assistance had abandoned him, and he was faced with terror and injury in his escape because he broke the one rule that was laid out before him. Now, I'm guessing most of us, we don't have near-infinite wealth, so the story won't really apply to us. But if we cast our minds back to last week in the discussion of lying, we can probably recognise the issue here. See, I'm willing to bet that every single one of us at some point has told a lie. I know for certain I'm guilty of this. I can't tell for everybody how that would. But the Ninth Commandment in the Bible forbids lying, the giving of false testimony. No doubt during your life you will have told a lie to gain an advantage somewhere. I'm not asking you to admit it, just know that you will have done. Ultimately though, what do we get from telling a lie? Keeping with that lie and the falsities around it wear you out, and ultimately you get caught out as well. My friend was very disappointed when they find out I hadn't actually discovered Pluto, and they cut contact with me. See, being rebuked and chastised and not allowed an ice cream may feel terrible when you're a child, for instance, but it's in an attempt to teach you that lying doesn't get you anywhere, and that in later life, greater hardships will await you from lying. Having looked at the commandments to just double check the order there, I also couldn't help but notice that the Tenth Commandment reminds you to not covet others' possessions, and probably our abilities too. See, as a small child, back playing computer games with my brothers, I was rather jealous of them being better than me at a lot of things. They were big brothers, they're a lot older than me. Me being jealous, I kind of didn't enjoy so much the things that I had enjoyed beforehand because of the jealousy. My enjoyment in those activities faded, and had I not given in to that jealousy, I would likely have retained greater interest in these things and found far greater happiness in what I was doing. In each of these cases though, whether it's the man with the ape, or me lying, or me being jealous of my brothers, it's clear that negative outcomes came about through lack of self-discipline. The idea of being sent to bed early without any supper is like the discipline of a parent or, parent or guardian within your formative years. And don't forget, one of the other commandments says, honour your father and your mother. But what about the discipline of God? Again, I'm going to use another example from my life because it's easy for me to draw on this. Nearly three years ago, I had to spend around a week in hospital with a heart virus right before Christmas. For a while, I did question whether I was ever going to be okay after this, but I was given the all clear not that long afterwards, thankfully. But the fear I had made me question a lot of things. Would I be the same annoying bundle of energy I was beforehand? And I think if you're watching this, you realise the answer is yes. Those who ever saw me working at the manor as well particularly experienced how bad I could be. But what had caused me to become sick? And what could I change about myself? Fortunately, there have been no lasting physical issues for me to deal with, and I am just as insufferable as I was beforehand. But that's not to say nothing changed. Before I got sick, I'd taken a lot of things for granted. I'd taken my health, my surroundings, my security, my family, my loved ones for granted. I worked how I was supposed to. I always put in maximum effort. But I didn't appreciate anything. I didn't appreciate my friends, my family, all the lovely places around Allsager, for example. And one thing I in particular had taken for granted was my faith. I was fairly new to being a Christian at this point, but I'd kind of already settled into the motions kind of thing a little bit, maybe. But this shock of being sick, this divine discipline, allowed me to rethink how I lived my life and helped enhance my faith. I was disciplined. I was rebuked, maybe. And I learned from it, and I improved. So back to Hebrews 12, 11. Being told off, being made to go to bed without supper, being unwell, they're all pretty painful in their own way, aren't they? I think we can all agree on that. But if we stop and think about learning a lesson from them, we realise that what we can get out of it makes us so much greater. If we really look at Hebrews 12 in greater context, we see that it follows on from Hebrews 11. Surprisingly, that's how numbers work. And that details how a lack of discipline leads to destruction. Hebrews 12 is basically the guide on how to avoid this destruction. Professional athletes, as an example, exhibit great examples of self-discipline. We've just had Euro 2020, the Olympics, and now the Paralympics has started. Everyone involved in them goes through intensive training and strictly controlled diets to allow themselves to compete at the highest level. I couldn't do this. They are not allowed Jaffa cakes or pizza. They become great though, through their discipline. Now, I'm not asking you to go out and win a gold medal in 2024 unless you really want to. But just think, 
If you follow God's discipline, then it produces a harvest of righteousness and peace. And if my students this upcoming year follow my discipline, they'll do well in their exams. I hope. It's not just training and practicing, though, in physical or academic pursuits that discipline is worthwhile, either. Spiritual discipline is something that's very much required to help our faith grow and our lives blossom. Back before I moved to Walsh, I used to take a train every day between York and Dewsbury of an evening. Get a slightly different train in the morning. It was a bit funny with that. But on Wednesdays, the train would be absolutely packed with people going to watch the football over in Manchester, whether it was Manchester United or Manchester City, whether it was European nights were particularly bad, or just Premier League matches. The train would get packed. So if you paid for the cheap tickets, which I did, you were crammed in like sardines, likely standing room only, all ready from one of the earlier stops on the route. However, if you paid a few pounds more, you could get a first class ticket, sit in the nice guaranteed comfy seats in first class and you get free coffee for the journey. So you put in that little bit more. It brings you comfort, brings you security, and it brings you coffee, which is also a good thing. If you also think though about a plant maybe in your garden or on your windowsill, if you put in the effort and water it, it'll grow and it'll flower. But if you ignore and leave it, it'll wither and die. In this respect, we need to be disciplined spiritually. Every morning I make sure that I read that passage that comes up on my phone and think about that over breakfast. Every day I'll make sure that I will pray about whether it's something for myself or something for somebody else. I do maybe the bare minimum. Maybe. I know I could do a bit more. But it's imperative and also not that tricky to find a bit of time in your day to consider the word and to say a prayer or two. If you make effort in your spiritual self then, like with watering the plant and gaining the flower from it, your faith will blossom and grow. Thinking about it though, one final note. I've talked about how discipline affects you directly as yourself, but think about how it affects others around you as well. The work we do affects our families, it affects our communities, it makes those around us better. I think the very greatest example of this though, and you should all be aware of this one, would be Jesus dying on the cross to bring us home bring us to him, bring us to our faith, bring us to God. What we have to do, in any respect, suddenly seems far less troubling, I'd say. If we think of discipline, then, I think a good way to put it, it's a short-term pain for a long-term gain. And to me, that definitely sounds worthwhile. Fantastic. Thanks so much, Alan, uh, for bringing us that word, and uh, well done. Really great. Uh, really, really great. Let's worship as we move towards the end of our service uh, together. It's been great to, uh, to, be, to share church together online. Um, look forward to seeing many of you next week, um, uh, 5th of September, um, in the All Sages Civic, back together uh, as church in person. Those who uh, wish to continue to still for the time being meet online uh, watch online and of course um, guests uh, that are that are joining us and uh, and seeing what's going on then you know fantastic to have to, to see you online as well so that would be brilliant but uh, let's worship together and um, give him glory
Christ alone. Fantastic. One last announcement before we go. And, uh, and that is, of course, that we will be running Alpha from the 29th of September. That's not very far away. That's one month from this date. And uh, so we really, really want people to be thinking and praying about how they can be involved, who they can bring to our Alpha launch event on the 29th. And then on, on from there, we'll be running the course for about eight weeks or so. Really want to encourage you to be praying about this. There is, you know, we really want to want to see people reach for Jesus. We really want to see see people um, uh, uh, helped and, and saved and, and transformed in his name. And uh, we have this opportunity of reaching out to people and so we want you to be thinking about um, who you can invite we will have some leaflets um, for that we're going to ask people to take a turn in delivering and helping us to deliver and get out there and that would be great and uh, we just want that to, we just want that to happen we just want this to be the best uh, we can we may be running an online um uh, dimension to it as well. We're going to be looking at that, um, but we are we are really um, wanting uh, everyone to just get behind this and to be praying and if you uh, be thinking about whom can I invite, invite God help me to invite uh, that person or those people, and that would be absolutely uh, fantastic. Um, we'll have some promo videos uh, from next week and all of that kind of stuff. Um, but uh, really want you to think about that. Uh, encourage you to get involved in that. Let's not miss this opportunity. That would be absolutely fantastic. Let's pray. Father God, we want to thank you for uh, our time together, gathering together today in church. Father God, may you use us. May you bless us. May you help us. Uh, Lord, as we seek to live for you uh, in the coming weeks, Father God, as we, uh, as we switch off our computers, our phones, our tablets at this moment, Father God, and, uh, and think about what we've heard. Think about what living for you means in the light of the, uh, the time together today. In Jesus' name, we want to give you glory and honour with our lives. In Jesus' name, Amen. Amen. So great to see you. So great to be with you. Um, let's say the grace, uh, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen. God bless. You take care and have a wonderful week.